Acts chapter 1. And we're going to read this morning, beginning in verse 4. It says, "...in being assembled together with them, He commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith He, You have heard of Me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence." And when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the season which the Father has put in his own power. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. When he had spoken these things, while they beheld him, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. I want to preach a message this morning entitled, Preparations of Pentecost. Preparations of Pentecost. Will you pray with me? Father, we just come once again in Jesus' name. Lord, I ask today for your anointing upon the reading, the preaching, and the hearing of the Word of God. Lord, I just pray today that You would pour out of Your Spirit upon us as You did those at the beginning. Lord, I just pray You would make our hearts hungry and thirsty for You, God, for a true move of God in our life. God, I pray that we wouldn't resist You, that we would yield ourselves to You today. Let Your will be done in our lives and in this place. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. The messages that God has given us uh, in in the recent weeks, I believe, have led us up to this this particular point. I believe that God has been preparing us for Pentecost. I read in a book several years ago that Calvary will always send a man to Pentecost. Calvary is where that new creature is created. It's where that old man dies. It's where the power of sin is broken and the the desire for the world is broken and new desires come in. Pentecost is where that new creature is equipped to serve God. Calvary will always send a man to Pentecost because we need help. It wasn't enough, you know, just for those early apostles, disciples, however you want to say it, for them to be born again, God wanted them to be filled with power from on high so that they could be witnesses unto Him. The word witness there in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, if you look it up in Strong's Concordance when you get home, it, it, it's, it's the word martyr. It's where we get the word martyr from. Martyr means somebody who who's, goes to the death to serve somebody else. A martyr is somebody who's willing to die for what they believe. You don't need the Holy Ghost if you're just going to sit on a church pew and go through the motions of religion. But if you're going to be a part of a last day's move of God, if you want to be a part of what God did in the book of Acts, you need to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Calvary sends a man to Pentecost because I need help. God never intended for His church to be run you know, off the wisdom or, the, or the, the, the strength, the ideas, the flesh of men. God was going to run that church. He was going to do it through human vessels that were filled with the Holy Spirit. God's been preparing us for Pentecost. You know, each generation must have its own Pentecost or that generation will be lost. The early church was the only church throughout history to really reach their generation. The Apostle Paul came on the scene. You know, first it was in the hands of Peter and James and John. But then God raised up a man named the Apostle Paul and sent him to the Gentiles. Gave him a revelation of the new covenant, the true meaning of the cross. The Apostle Paul was filled with the Holy Ghost and he was sent out into the... And at the end of his life, he could say, I have preached the Gospel to the known world 
of my time. He fulfilled what God had called him to do. Each generation must have its own Pentecost or that generation will be lost. And without a Pentecost, the church of that day will be weak and it will be powerless. You look at where the church is today for the most part. and You look at the programs and all of this stuff, it's powerless in the face of hell. There was no program. Jesus gave those disciples Disciples on that in those instructions that we read, and other than get into that temple, wait, don't go preach, don't go sing, don't go do anything. Get in that temple, tarry there, and wait for the promise of the Father. I've told you about it. Don't worry about the times and the seasons. It doesn't matter what time you live in. It doesn't matter what season it's in. You're going to receive power from on high. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and God was able to take those people ordinary men and women fishermen tax collector there was no theologian in the crowd there was no scholar in the crowd God was able to take those men fill them with His Spirit and put them out no training, no none of that put them out into the same crowd that crucified the Lord Jesus Christ about 50 days earlier. And the result of it was 3,000 of them were pricked in their heart and said, what must I do to be saved? That is the results of Pentecost. That's the result of not man's wisdom, not man's flesh. That's the result of what God can do if He can find His vessel. All God ever needed was a man that would let Him have His way in their life. And all that man ever needed was God. I don't mean God needs us, but I mean that the plans and the purposes of God on this earth are always carried out through human vessels, human instruments. God already knew how to build an ark and how to save a family and pursue them. But He had to go and get a Noah that would obey Him and go out and build that ark. God already knew how to kill a nine foot tall giant with a rock in his forehead. He only needed a little shepherd boy that everybody thought was crazy and insane to go down to the creek, get a rock, and throw it at that giant. That's what God needed. And this whole Bible that we have is a testimony of God dealing with men. Dealing with people. Using them. Doing things in their life that was greater than what they were. The church was born on the day of Pentecost speaking in other tongues. Peter, James, Paul, even Mary... All of them were Pentecostal. I don't mean Pentecostal in some denomination or some hairdo or some dress code. I mean Pentecostal in experience. When you talk about being Pentecostal, that means you believe in, you identify with, you want or you have received what those disciples received on the day of Pentecost. Being filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Pentecost in experience. Religion has conditioned us. You know, I grew up in a place I didn't know a thing about the Holy Ghost. I'm not a fifth generation Pentecostal preacher. I'm a first generation preacher. I, I come from a place where I think just most people in Mississippi only go so far with God. We get a little enough security that I'm going to go to heaven when I die. I don't worry about the rest of it. But I met Jesus in a real powerful way as I said earlier, about eight years ago, God began to open up things to me. He began to open up grace and faith that I preach every week. And He began to open up to me the message of Pentecost. And it has transformed and changed my life. I grew up in a place I didn't know anything about the Holy Ghost. Nobody came to the altar. Nobody lifted their hands. Nobody said Amen. I never saw anybody lay hands on the sick and pray for them. I didn't know anything about it. I thought that Pentecostal people held snakes and that crazy and all that kind of stuff. But then I started reading the Bible. Mm -hmm. Then I started seeing what God had to say. 
You've heard what men have to say. Religion will condition you to fight against God. Do you know that you can take a newborn puppy and throw him in a pool of water and that little puppy will swim out? Because that's what he's born, knowing how to do that. Do you know you can take a 30-year-old man who's never seen water before and he will fight that water until he drowns because he thinks he knows so much. It's the same way religion conditions us to fight against what God wants to give us. I begin to seek the Lord and I I just begin to feel like this. I believe you ought to feel like this. Lord, I want everything that You have for me. If you could see this morning the price that Jesus paid so that you could be filled with the Holy Ghost, you would want every ounce, every drop of it that could be poured out upon you because it wasn't just... This was the purpose and the plan of God from all time. You understand that in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit could only come and visit for a little while. He must have come upon Noah and helped him build that ark. He must have come upon David to help him slay that giant. He came upon Samson. He came upon other men, but it was only for a season because the blood of bulls and goats could only cover sin. It could not take away sin. So the Holy Spirit would come and help them do what they needed to do, but then He would have to go away. But at Calvary, the Lamb of God did not cover sin. He took away the sin of the whole world. It's not covered. It's washed. It's cleaned. It's It's separated as far as the east is from the west. And God don't remember it anymore. Now most of the church, when we hear that, we just find a good pew to fall asleep on and say, well, that's good news. And God, I'll see you in heaven when I die. But you open up the Bible. If that is supposed to be our pattern, that's not where they stopped, Brother Robert. That's where they started. They pressed on into God each and every day. Somehow, they were weak people. They were frail. Some of them, all of them, when He was on the cross, except for one, forsook Him and fled. They run away from Him. Simon Peter, the man who's getting ready to preach here in a little bit, he denied that he even knew that Christ but the Holy Ghost is he's not... God wasn't up there fretting saying, man, I hope Peter can do a good job today. He would say, no, I'm going to pour this Spirit out upon this weak, frail, sometimes ignorant and stupid man, cowardly man, but I'm going to pour my Spirit out upon him. I'm going to give him an ability that is not of him, and I'm going to use him to do something that people will be reading about in amazement for the next two 2,000 years. That's what God wants to do. Not just come and go, but come and stay. Come and abide. Come and remain. Come and be here. And I'm talking about just an experience that we can have around an altar. There was a man one time I, that had left a, you know, a Pentecostal church and was in a Baptist church. And I just asked him, I said, why in the world would you do that? You know, were you, were you filled with the Holy Ghost? And he said, well, they said I was one time. They said I was one time. And I'm I just looking back now, well, I know you wasn't. If they said you you get filled with the Holy Ghost, you'll know it. There won't be a doubt in your mind. You'll know it. I'm not the most belligerent of of Spirit-filled preachers. I don't just get up on the platform all the time and just go on and on speaking in tongues. I'll tell you this, when people come through that door back there, my, my agenda, my heart is do they know Jesus? Because that's what the Holy Spirit, Jesus said He will do. He will glorify Jesus. He will take the things of Christ and show them to you. So the, 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 the thrust of my ministry, what I believe God has called me to do, It's to preach Christ. That's what the Holy Ghost at work in me calls me to do. To preach Christ. I've told you, it's not my nature to to, to get up here and talk and to say all these things. I can work on that farm all day long and not say three words. But God came upon me and filled me and called me into the ministry so that where I get it, if I get an opportunity to speak into somebody's life that will make an eternal difference, 
I don't want to be staring at the floor. I don't want to be wringing my hands. I want to say it with all the love, all the boldness, all the clarity in my heart because it's so real. To, it's the most real thing that I know of. Most real thing that I know of. And you imagine, can you imagine getting to heaven and you see all these things? And you say, what is that? And Jesus says, that's the table that I prepared for you. That's all these gifts that I wanted to give you. There's the baptism, the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. There's a gift of healing. There's a gift of prophecy. There's a gift of miracles. There's a gift of faith. There's all these things that are in the Bible. Not something some man went and made out of. Do you believe this Bible? Do you believe Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever? And you said, no, I don't want all that. I just want to go to heaven. And I just want to live my life. I tell you what, people leave religion every day because it gets old. It gets so boring. You know what's going to happen before you get there. It's very hard for a man to leave Christ. For a woman to leave Christ. For children to grow up in an atmosphere where Jesus Christ is real. He's alive. God's been doing real stuff in our church. God's been healing people. God's been making... Our God is a real God. He does real things. I was able to sell that piece of equipment a few days ago. I believe that's a miracle from God. I really do. I really do. I've been praying for years. Lord, I want to get out of debt. I don't want to be off down somewhere working in a, in a dirt pit. I, I'm thankful for the jobs that, that God gives me, but I've been called to do something else and I want to do that. But i got a family to support. i got bills to pay. Lord, help me to get out of this. Because I want to run hard after God. I don't want to drag my feet. I don't want to walk. I don't want to jog. I want to run hard after Him. I want it when I get to heaven. I don't want there to be anything left on the table. I want it all. Whatever it is, God, You want to do in my life. I don't belong to me to pick and choose. I belong to Him. I believe God wants every, all of His people to be filled with the Spirit. When people get filled with the Spirit, they speak in tongues. You see that in the Bible. But it's not so we can just sit in here and rattle that off. That ain't what they did. They went out into that dark, lost world and preached Christ. They healed the sick. They cast out devils. They did what Jesus would have done if He would have been there with them. He was with them. Instead of standing beside them, He's living inside of them. That's what He does. That's what Jesus does. That's what we want. That's what we desire. That's what we seek for. I want to be in line with this Bible. I don't care about being popular with men. I want to be right with God. I want to walk with Him. I want to know what God is doing and go with Him. They were were baptized with the Spirit. John chapter 14, 15, and 16, Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit. And most of that, a lot of it is really about the indwelling Spirit, the new birth and regeneration. But in the book of Acts, it's really the baptism of the Holy Spirit is power for service. If you notice, however many there were in that upper room there, the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and begin to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. Not 90%, not 60%, not some and not others, but they were all. This is a gift God wants to give each and every individual. I didn't know anything about it, but when I heard about it, I started believing believe it. Because faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by the Word of God. I didn't know about any of this stuff because I grew up in a place where it was it was pretty much non-existent. I didn't know about it. Now understand, I'm not throwing rocks at anybody. I'm thankful for everyone that's in my past that's helped me to get to this place where I am today. I'm just telling you, if God has more for you, don't stay where you are. If God has bigger, God has better, don't die right there and shrivel up. Dive in. 
And you can trust God. Like I was saying a while ago, He is a solid rock. That You're not going to sink if you dive on Him. No, oh, you're going to be strong. You're going to... People said all kind of things about me when we left that Baptist church. I was scared to death. But I just knew this. I have to go on. If I stay here, I will shrivel up and die because I've done it already a dozen times. And I'm, I don't care what it costs. I'm going on with Him. We got in the boat with Jesus to go to the other side. Every kind of storm you could think of come up. I had days where I would, when I wasn't working, I would go into the back bedroom of that trailer house and I would open up my Bible, put my face on the pages and just cry, cry, cry. God, You have got to speak to me. You have got till I feel so alone. I feel so afraid. I feel so scared. But it was each and every time God would come through. God would show me things. Faith comes by here. He pulled the love of money, the love for the things of this world out of my heart. I just want Jesus. I could be working in a place surrounded by men, but my heart is just thumping for Him. I want to know Him. Oh, I hadn't done it perfectly. I failed. People in this room have seen me fall. My wife has seen me fall. It looked like I wasn't going to get up again. But He comes to restore my soul. He shows me where we've come from and where we've been brought through. A friend of mine, and I don't believe he did it because he was a friend of mine. I believe he did it because he was instructed by the Lord. But he prophesied over me in my life that God was using me to break a path through the wilderness, through a desert place. It was hard. It was dangerous. It was difficult. I would meet so many adversaries. But if I don't finish this course, there's a lot of people behind you that are not going to be able to make it to the other side. God may use you to spearhead. A, like I said, I'm not fifth generation Pentecostal, but that don't matter. You can change your family tree now. I want my boys and my little girl to love Jesus, worship Him, walk with Him in the full counsel of God. The Bible says a good man leaves an inheritance to his children and his children's children. I don't think that's money and gold, silver and land. I believe that's Jesus. I believe that's the reason that America is in the condition that it's in today. You ought to have a you ought to have a testimony in your you ought to know your grandmother's testimony of how she got saved. You ought to know your granddaddy's testimony of how he was saved and born again. How Jesus changed his life. You ought to know your mama and daddy's testimony. Not that they just go to church, but of how Jesus really changed their life so that it's real to you. And I pray to God that my children would see that this is real to me. There's times we mess up as parents. I've had to apologize to them boys is more probably than I've apologized to anybody. But I ain't going to make excuses for the way I act sometimes or losing my temper or whatever. No, we'll build an altar. I'll tell you I'm sorry and that I did wrong. But we're going to grow. And as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen. I begin to hear about these things and I begin to seek God for what I saw in the Word of God. I remember the first time anybody laid hands and prayed, for, laid hands on me and anointed my head with oil and prayed for me. I was 21, 22 years old. I remember me and my wife just being so excited about what God was doing. All hell might have been breaking loose all around us. I'm excited about what God was doing. I had headaches my life at that time and I went to the doctor so many times they had me on so much medicine I fell asleep one day driving a tractor at work could have killed myself I woke up I threw them pills away I said I ain't doing this anymore I'm going to believe God went and got an MRI no insurance that thing was three or four thousand dollars all this goes on you know I couldn't find anything wrong with me Went to a church service one Sunday morning. They laid hands on me and prayed for me. And it was that evening drive. I'm talking about I would wake up in the morning with a headache. I would go to bed at night with a headache. 
I would cry, my head would hurt so bad. I don't know what's wrong with me. No doctor knew what was wrong with me. One doctor offered me to put put me on some medicine that would control my mood and stress and anger and anxiety and all this kind of stuff. I said, I, I didn't know a whole lot, but I knew I didn't want none of that. Uh-uh. But I found myself down there at that altar. We were on our way home from church that Sunday night, and I realized no headache. And I'm not saying I don't get a little headache every night, but I'm talking about that pain, that feeling that I had. Amen. God healed me. I've seen God heal other people. I, we came home from church one night on a Wednesday night. It was in, in 2016, I was at work one day. My wife went to the doctor and came, called me and said, they told me that I have diabetes. You know, when you think of diabetes, you feel like somebody, you think of somebody probably that don't take care of themselves, eat everything they see, you know, and they brought that upon themselves. But I think about my wife, and I just can't, I can't believe it. Well, in the matter of a day, our whole world changed. She has a different type. It's a type, type one. And your, your pancreas just shuts down, and you... Your, your, your body doesn't produce insulin anymore. Well, in a day, our whole world changed. I was crying. I didn't know what to do. You know, I never heard of anything like that. And we just, anyway, and, you know, and all those monitors and needles and blood pressure and insulin, you know, and I just, I just couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. Well, and it broke my heart. I'm just like this. If somebody in my family is going to suffer, I'd rather it be me. I'd rather take it all. And lay, you know, I, and I hated to see that she had to deal with that, you know, and live with that. But one night we had come home from church on a Wednesday night, and Logan, I don't know, he must have been four, four or five, I don't know, and he, was, he wasn't acting right. He wasn't feeling good. And we brought him in and laid him on the bed, and Lauren took his blood pressure, blood sugar, and it was three or four hundred. I can't remember the exact number. But it's supposed to be about a hundred. This is enough to kill somebody where his blood pressure is. And it was just like a knife stabbed in my heart. And I just said, Look, I didn't know what to do. And Lauren was saying, we got to go. we got to get him to the hospital. we got to go. And I just said, you, you've got to give me a minute. You have to wait. Because all I could see was that little boy with all those needles and all that stuff, you know, and I just, I, I just, I, I couldn't deal with that. I couldn't take that. So I took him in there and I laid him on the bed. He's barely moving and he's just breathing. I put him in there on that bed and I didn't even know what to say to God. All I could say was, You have got to help me. That's all I could say. You have got to help me. And I just began to pray just in my spirit. And I laid hands, we laid our hands on that boy. And about 30 minutes later, she checked his blood sugar again. Absolutely perfect. Absolutely perfect. God healed him. God came into that room. God did that. I've seen, a, I could go on and on. I've walked into hospital rooms where I'm getting ready to preach somebody's funeral. Me and my wife have gone in. There. I'm not a healer. I'm not trying to communicate. I'm just telling you, I believe in a God that can heal. I know He can heal. I know that He can. I believe in the Pentecostal working of the Spirit. I know He can. People, I'm getting ready to preach that funeral, and here they come. <laughs> Walk back into church a few weeks later. Amen. I've had other people that I prayed and believed God for that it didn't turn out the way I wanted to. But I still know He's a healer. He still, I still know He is. I've seen too much. i have convinced of it. The coming of the Spirit was power for service. Power to serve God. You don't have to speak in tongues to go to heaven. You don't have to be baptized with the Holy Ghost to go to heaven. That's not what I'm saying. But you need it for power, for service. If you want to serve God, you want to live like they lived, you want to walk. God never intended for His church to be run 
through the flesh, through man's wisdom, man's power. But God was going to run that church through human vessels that were filled with the Spirit. If you read in the book of Acts, excuse me, if you read in the Bible at the end of all the Gospels, the disciples are filled with mourning. Even... You know, after the cross, they were, they were mourning, they were sad. Even after they saw Him resurrected, they were still just... Peter said, I'm going back fishing. I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what this is about. Maybe I've failed too bad. Maybe I've messed up too much. I, I don't know. The easiest thing for any of us to do is to go back to that old life. If we don't keep walking with Jesus, that's where we're going. Back to that old life. It's the Holy Spirit that makes Jesus more real, more fresh, more sweet each and every day. Oh, I was talking to Carter this week and I was just telling him the script. I believe it's Lamentations 3.23. But the Bible says that God's mercy is new every morning. Great is Thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. And I was just telling him, you know, just how if yesterday was a bad day, today is not yesterday. If today was a bad day, tomorrow is not today. And when you see that sun coming up in the morning, let it be a reminder, God's mercy is new. Today is a new day. Don't let to yesterday carry off into today. Don't let today carry off into tomorrow. It's a new day. God has new mercies. God has new things that, that He wants to do in each and every one of us. But those disciples, you know, they're mourning. They're sad. Jesus would talk about going to the cross, dying, be raised again on the third day. They, Peter would take Him and shake Him and say, No, Lord, You're not going to no cross. We have to understand one of the things was they saw all the good that Jesus was doing. He's healing the sick. He's casting out devils. He's feeding the hungry. He's doing all this stuff. He's making people that have been abandoned and rejected by religion, now they're feeling the true love of God, the true love of the Father that they find in Jesus. What good's it going to do for you to die? If you die, all this is going to stop. Acts 10.38, the Bible says of the story of how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost. He went about healing the sick, uh, casting out devils, and doing good to all that were oppressed by the devil because God was with him. And they couldn't understand why He would die. They're sad. They're mourning after He did. But you flip over into the book of Acts, there's no mourning. There's no sadness in the book of Acts because that same Christ that they saw go up in those clouds came back in the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Jesus said in John 14, 18, He said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come unto you. The word comfortless means an orphan. We're not orphans in this world. Jesus came, not in, as God in the flesh, but as God the Holy Ghost in the Spirit. Jesus came to abide with His people. He came to abide with us. Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, we read it. He said, you will receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus said, all power in heaven and earth it has been given unto me. This is power, not in a force, but in a person. Jesus said power is going to come upon you. But He said all power has been given unto me. God in the person of the Holy Spirit. This is a good gift. This is what God wants to give to all of His church. If you... Flip over a few pages just quickly. Flip with me to Luke chapter 11. We're going to be talking about a lot of this in our discipleship class. I failed to mention that in our announcements earlier, but there will be no church here tonight going on vacation, going to the mountains. Somebody paid for us to go on vacation, and we appreciate that. And we're going up there. There will be no church here tonight, but... We'll be here next Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Next Sunday night at 6 o'clock, we're going to start our foundations class. 
We're going to go through that. We're going to talk more about the Spirit of God and the way He moves in that class on Sunday nights at 6 o'clock. But Jesus, in Luke chapter 11 and verse 9, He said, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asks, receives. Everybody say, Everyone. Everyone that asks receives, and he that seeks finds. And to him that knocks it shall be opened. Listen to this now. If a son shall ask bread of any of you fathers, will you give him a stone? Or if your son asks you for a fish, will you give him a scorpion instead? A, a serpent, a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, Will you give him an egg containing a scorpion? Listen to this. If you then be an evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? You know, I've heard people say, most of it was just ignorance. They didn't know any better. They say, you know, Pentecost is of the devil. I couldn't think of you. You need to be very, very careful by saying that, because Jesus said this: You can say what you want to say about the Father, you can say what you want to say about His Son, but if you blaspheme that Holy Ghost, I won't forgive you in this life or in the life to come. He went on to say, with that, that if you offend that little one that's coming to me. It'd be better for you to have a millstone tied around your neck and you thrown into the sea than for you to have to face me on the day of judgment. That's not just a little child, though that is included, but it means those children, those disciples, if you don't want it, you don't want it, just get out of the way because that's the direction that we're going in. That's the direction that God is leading us to. And Jesus promised us, you can come to the Father. You know, if your child runs up to you and asks, you for something. If he wants bread, you don't give him a rock. If he wants a fish, you don't give him a snake. If I come and ask God to fill me with the Holy Ghost, He's not going to fill me with some devil. Oh, He's going to give me a good gift. He's going to give me something that I need. Something that I can use. That was what it was for. It was to be used for a purpose. It was a weapon that they would use. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5 that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of every stronghold and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And that's what those disciples did. They went out and they did warfare each and every day. Warfare against that devil and they pulled down His strongholds. They tore down everything that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. They lived in conflict just like Jesus did. Every day that Jesus lived, there was a great warfare because He was the only one on this earth that was really subject to His Father. Can you imagine that? The only one on the planet Really walking with God. The only one completely subject to His Father. Other men, their mind was on paying their bills, taking care of their families, having a good day. There were other men there who were religious men, but we know the Pharisees and Sadducees. It was all external. It was nothing going on in their heart. They weren't really right with God. There were other people there that were controlled and possessed by demon spirits. There were other men there. They served Rome. They served King Herod. They served Caesar. But Jesus was able to walk in the midst of all of that. He said, I only go where my Father tells me to go. I only say what I hear my Father say. I only do what my Father has commanded me to do. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8, for this purpose was the Son of God made manifested that He might destroy the works of the devil. And that's what He did. 
everywhere He went. He healed sickness. He overcame death. He cleansed sin. He confronted religion everywhere He lived. Everywhere He went, there was conflict. He didn't come to defend heaven. But as one man said, He came as a man of war and He declared war on the devil from the beginning of the ministry. He whipped him each and every day. And then at Calvary, the Bible says, He finished the job. He overcome that serpent. He bruised His head. He overcome this world. He overcome everything that would come against us. And He hands us the victory. But you have to believe it. You have to want it. You have to say, I see it. I believe it. And I'm going to walk in it. I'm going to walk as He walked. I'm going to walk in that anointing. I'm going to walk in that power. I'm not just hoping to slide into heaven. I want to do what He did. I want to confront the devil in my life, in my family, in my world, where I work, in my church. I want to see another Pentecost. I want to see God do what only God could do. Amen. That was the body of Christ. The literal body on that day. And after He ascended into heaven, and on the day of Pentecost, He took up another body. Now He's in Peter. Now He's in James. Now He's in John. Now He's in His mother Mary. Now He's in Mary Magdalene. Now He's in Matthew. Now He's in all of these people. A little bit later, He's going to be in 3,000 more that were born again on the day of Pentecost. This is why Jesus said, the works that I've done, you've seen them, but greater works are you're going to do because I'm going to My Father. Not meaning that we'll do greater things than Jesus did, but it'll be greater in quantity because God is not limited to one Jewish man walking around Jerusalem. God's in you. God's in me. God's in a couple billion people all around this world this morning. In you. Walk in it. Walk in the Spirit. Oh God, let Him have His way in your life. The true church in their day were the only ones in the world truly subject to the Father. Everywhere they went, there was conflict. Some of you are running into conflict in your life. And it's because in this world, you're only one of the few that is really subject to the Father. Everything else is out of line. This is a messed up, sin-filled world. God, if you're a believer, God has taken you and placed you into Christ. That is reality. The Spirit of God helps us to see what we cannot see. The reality in this world, what do you look like? How much money do you have? What do you drive? Where do you live? Where do you work? Who do you hang out with? But the reality with God is do you know my Son? Amen. Does He live in you? Who's building your life? Am I the potter or are you the potter? Am I Is my Spirit at work in your life or are you the Spirit that's at work in your life? That's what it all boils down to. That's how this world is going to be separated in the end. No gray area. And you're going to, if you're going to walk with Jesus, you're going to live in conflict. Can you imagine the Holy Spirit just tiptoeing around the devil? Hope he don't notice me. Hope I don't aggravate him today. I don't really feel like dealing with it. I just can see him just walking right up there and smacking him upside the head. What are you doing here? Get out of here. You've got no right. You've got no authority. You are stripped of your power, your authority. I know the truth about you, devil. You may have deceived this whole world, but Jesus crushed your head. He did not die in weakness. He did not die a victim. He died as a man of war. I'm not preaching about a dead hero this morning, but I'm talking about a living, glorified Christ who lives in the hearts and lives of His people. Yes, He's real. Yes, He's real. 
And it's the Holy Ghost that makes Him real and alive in His church. Anything outside of that is a corpse. And it just needs to be buried. Get it out of sight. God wants to live inside of us. God wants to work inside of us. There's going to be conflict. They went to prison. They were beaten. They were stoned. Shipwrecked. Left for dead. All kind of things said about them. But even their enemies looked at them and said, these men have been with Jesus. Amen. Such a mark in their life. I just That's what I want as my testimony. This man has been with Jesus. Why? Because I can see Him in you. Jesus said, if you've seen Me, you've seen the Father. I believe that the true church ought to be able to say, if you've seen Me, you've seen Jesus. No, I'm not Him. And I'll never be Him. But if He lives inside of me, you ought to be able to see it. You ought to be able to tell it. No matter how great the conflict, the Holy Spirit will give you the power for Christ to be revealed in your life. You know, I just think about my own self. If I was walking somewhere going to preach and they jumped on me with rods and stones and they beat me, I don't know what would come out. It probably would not be. Forgive them. Because they don't know what they're doing. I'd be trying to grab one of them stones after it bounced off of me. Take that rod out of your hand. You better run. You know, you better kill me with it before I get up from here. That's that old man. That's my flesh. That's man's wisdom. That's power. that's the Spirit of God wants to come and consume that so that we're so full of Jesus that you squeeze me any way you want to, and what's on the inside is going to come out. I pray to God that it would be Christ. This is what we're talking about, folks. Not just some crazy emotion, anything like that. I'm talking about the true Spirit of the living God to make Christ real in this world. To make Christ real in your heart. To make Him real in your life. I'll tell you this, God's purpose with us in this life is threefold and it all has to do with the Spirit. That you would be born of the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, and that you would be led by the Spirit of God. He is God in our world today. I can tell you this, God stood on this earth at one time and they didn't want Him. They could not recognize Him. Even the most religious, they called Him a demon-possessed blasphemer. They stripped Him naked, they beat Him, and they nailed Him to a tree and said, we do not want You. That same God has come back in the Holy Spirit. Some said these men are drunk and mockers and all such things like that. But some people rose up and said, that's what I want. That's what I need. On that day of Pentecost, the Spirit came in a new day, in a new way. And it was the birthday of the church. Again, God took ordinary people and used them to do supernatural extraordinary things. Today, this same God, that's what He's looking for now, is just willing vessels. The only requirement there is to be filled with the Holy Spirit is that you be born again. That you be saved. It's just like everything else. You can't earn it. 